Well, good morning. Very glad you were able to uh, show up this morning uh, for what's going to be, I think, a very interesting uh, breakfast presentation. I'm very pleased that uh, the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies and the Seedman School of Business uh, Alumni Association could team up to present this morning's event. I'm Gleaves Whitney, director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies. We're going to be co-hosting a, a speaker this morning who is an economist and he is uh, going to upstage all those talking heads out there. We're going to be able to tune out the TV for the next six months because we'll know who's going to be president after we hear Patrick Anderson. But before I formally introduce Patrick, uh, let me just say a word about a man that no one thought would be president of the United States, and that's Ronald Reagan. You know, uh, we're thinking so much about uh, President Reagan these days, and uh, his opponent in 1980 was delighted that Ronald Reagan was the one who got through the primaries, and uh, they underestimated him, of course, and, but they were glad that Reagan beat out Howard Baker and George Bush to go on to uh, run for president. And last week, I was in Washington for President Reagan's funeral and all of the festivities, the ceremonies uh, surrounding that. The festivities were the alumni of the Reagan administration who would get together and uh, reminisce and really uh, have a good time talking about the good old days when they served in government for those eight years in Washington. We had the opportunity to hear many wonderful stories about uh, President Reagan and also some of the stories that President Reagan himself liked to tell. And there was one that had to do with economists. And Reagan liked to tell a, a story of, of his predecessor, Harry Truman, who uh, would be very frustrated by economists. And this story in particular will show you why. Truman asked that uh, three economists be brought in to the Oval Office to comment on Truman's economic plan. And one economist said, well, on the one hand, if you do this, something bad will happen. And on the other hand, if you do that, something worse will happen. Well, Truman looked at him and said, okay, what's the next economist have to say? On the one hand, if you do this, something bad will happen. If you do that, something even worse is going to happen. And Truman's starting to mutter, you know, what is going on here? What's the third economist have to say? Well, on the one hand, if you do X, Mr. President, this bad thing's going to happen. If, if you do that, something even worse is going to happen. Truman, exasperated, finally snapped at his aides, can't you people find me a one-armed economist? Well, this morning we have the pleasure of having an economist that has both arms and both feet on the ground, I should add. Uh, Patrick Anderson uh, comes to us from Lansing, and he's somebody that I think both Harry Truman and Ronald Reagan would have liked. Patrick earned his BA and MA in economics from the University of Michigan, and he uh, took a job with the CIA uh, early in his career. He earned his spurs in economics and public policy working for Dick Headley, uh, author of the famous Headley Amendment to the Michigan Constitution. And he served in the Engler administration. He, in fact, he was the deputy budget director with the president of our institution, Mark Murray. He served as chief of staff for Secretary of State Candace Miller. And for a number of years now, Patrick has had his own consulting firm in Lansing, Anderson Economic Group. He's always doing something interesting where economics and public policy intersect. In fact, he has been part of the brain trust for four constitutional amendments that have been on the Michigan ballot. Uh, two of those four amendments, by the way, passed. Not a bad track record. As if all this were not enough to keep Patrick busy, uh, in his spare time he has worked up uh, an economic model that tries to predict who will win the presidency in any given uh, four-year cycle. And I know you're as interested as I am in finding out what his predictions are going to be about who our president's going to be for the next four years. In fact, let me just say as an aside, uh, we have the Commerce Secretary in from Washington on campus today, and I wish he were here because he would know then if he's going to have a job or not if he comes here and listens to you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, welcome Patrick Anderson. Uh, thank you, Gleese, for that nice introduction, and I'm so confident in my prediction here, I'm going to do it with one arm tied behind my back. So, uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here at, the, at this uh, event at the Hallenstein Center in the Seedman School. Nice to be here with uh, Mr. Hallenstein, and we're going to talk about pocketbook predictions for the next presidential election. Uh, joining me here is Ilhan Gekel, who's my co-author with this uh, uh, particular report. Ilhan's a native of Turkey and a graduate of Coach College in, in uh, 
Turkey and also MSU and been an economist with us for the past three years. Well, let me give you the outline here of our presentation. We're going to talk about uh, our first, are voters predictable? Good question if you're going to predict them. Are they predictable at all? How do pocketbook issues affect voter preferences? What does the pocketbook model say about the 2004 election? And then finally, we'll uh, have an interesting look at how Michigan voters react to pocketbook issues and how that's different from those of the uh, nation as a whole. Okay, first question, are voters predictable? We'd obviously like to know this. Well, there's a motivation, and of course, for those of us who are in, uh, sometimes do academic work, you have to have a motivation for your theory. Here's my motivation. Voters in a republic ought to be rational, meaning they ought to select a candidate that they feel would represent their views or improve their satisfaction with life. And of course, your pocketbook, economic issues, whether or not you have a job, is a big part of whether you're satisfied with life. So there's our motivation. We would think that voters would, in fact, look at their pocketbook when they make their uh, electoral decisions. Now, to put together a model here, we're going to make some simplifying assumptions, of course. One is that we're going to say that economic well-being is the dominant measure of satisfaction. And later on, we'll, we'll get a little test of whether it's the dominant measure or not. And that voters reward past performance, or at least view past performance as prologue. So with those simplifying assumptions, we then tend to go forward and say, all right, voters that are happy tend to reward the incumbent party. Well, it's not exactly the same thing here. We're making some simplifying assumptions. But if you had Ronald Reagan for two terms and you like what he's done, you are likely to vote for his vice president or at least his successor in the Republican Party. And similarly, if you uh, liked Bill Clinton, chances are that you will like to vote for Al Gore. It's a simplifying assumption we've used throughout here. And then we note that there are other factors. And we'll get back to this, but party affiliation, you may, no matter what, never vote for Bill Clinton or never vote for George Bush because that you're a strong partisan of one party or another. There may be a war on, or there may be a threatened war that may affect strongly your view. And you may be just plain tired with whoever's in office. All these things also explain uh, voter behavior. We'll get to those too. So we come to our hypothesis. Our hypothesis here is that voters are predictable. Rational voters should reward the incumbent party with more votes if they're happy with economic performance, and that pocketbook issues, how much money people have, should dominate electoral behavior over time. Not determine all elections, but should be the dominant, uh, dominant influence, and then we recognize that other factors will also matter. That makes it a horse race, and those of you who watched the Belmont Stakes saw that the favorite doesn't always win, so uh, even though uh, all these things are out here and we can predict them, may not predict everything. Now we'll come to the question. How do pocketbook issues affect the election? Well, we uh, decided we would test this. We looked at presidential elections since 1860. And we compared the share of votes that were gained by the incumbent party with those by the major party in opposition. And we concluded here that there is a clear connection between the economic variables and the votes for the incumbent party. We'll go on and tell you exactly how. In fact, we've done a lot of these, and other people have done the, these as well. Uh, probably the, the best known economist has done some other work is a guy by the name of Ray Fair from Yale University. He's published a whole book on predicting these, which, uh, which we've taken a look at. Uh, and I've done some work in the past, and generally you, you do find out that there are some variables that consistently predict how voters are going to behave. And we pick out five specific variables that consistently affect voter behavior, recognizing that there are going to be some other things that we can't explain. But here are five things that do predict behavior. Number one, income growth. This is the pure pocketbook issue. As a matter of fact, people don't use the term pocketbook that much anymore. But if they did, probably the purest pocketbook measure would be how much money is in your pocketbook. How much earnings do you have, how much money you're carrying around. Uh, a kind of a pure economic measure of that would be real disposable income, money after taxes, and after you take into account inflation. Clearly affects. Second, employment. Growing unemployment unnerves voters. There was an old uh, uh, you know, one-armed economist definition. What's a recession? What's a depression? What's good times? Good times is when you have a job and your neighbors have a job. Recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. 
Uh, and that's a rough guide to, to what's good time, what's bad time. Uh, and it clearly shows up here. Growing unemployment unnerves voters, less jobs, less votes. Variable number three, war. Pretty consistently in a war, especially a full mobilization war like World War II, the Korea World War I, voters tend to rally around the commander in chief. They do view wartime as different times and they have different expectations for their satisfaction. And you can see, especially in World War II, you can see consistent, strong support for the commander in chief then. Now it's interesting about after war, it's not so much the same. And there is a whole inconclusive area of research about what is a limited war? What happens in a war like we have right now where it's, it's not, it doesn't seem as clear cut as World War II did? Doesn't mean it's less important, but we don't have the same kind of, of declared war and ending of it that seem very clean. Okay, number four, voter. Voter fatigue, or we might call it official neglect. Uh, after two terms, voters tend to get tired of the same party in office. Or perhaps the elected officials tend to get complacent. There is a statistically significant two terms preference for voters. This is very interesting. Uh, Gleaves mentioned my involvement in the uh, in, in a couple of constitutional amendments. One of them was the 1992 amendment to the Michigan Constitution. I was not informed of this at the time that I was working on that. Uh, but if I was, it would have been very interesting that you actually, doing the analysis over time, there's a statistically significant effect that after two terms, people are less likely to reelect the incumbent. And I can't tell you whether that's because voters are tired of them or the elected officials just get complacent and start to neglect them. Also, what, what, voters, uh, what variables predict here? Rational voters should consider all the candidates. So here's another one, third party candidates. They often affect the election even though they rarely win major states. That, when I say rarely, that doesn't mean never, just means rarely and they often affect it. Actually, they affect the, the election more often than I think most people give them credit. Now, the last election, Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader didn't win a single state, got about 2%. Uh, nationwide, but he also got about 2% in Florida. And the margin in Florida was razor thin, as we all know. The Nader vote in Florida very clearly affected that vote, uh, the votes in that state. The Buchanan votes, uh, despite all the falderall you saw on CNN, etc., had almost nothing to do with Florida, but the Nader votes did. Uh, so Nader affected last, last time, even though it was only 2%. Ross Perot in 1992. And we'll get to 1992, one of the most difficult to explain elections. Uh, Ross Perot had a, had a huge impact in that one there. Uh, this is a difficult to model variable. One of the important questions is what's an important third party candidate? We almost always have third party candidates. Uh, I remember being astonished to learn that the Communist Party USA was on the ballot almost every year. Uh, but uh, you always have third party candidates. What's an important one? When you have an important one with lots of ballot access, and with lots of visibility, it affects the election. Okay, and then another factor here, the good news factor, and this is interesting uh, because uh, you would think rational people would take into account you know, how much their earnings have grown over the whole four year term and average things out, and to some extent they do, but it's also clear that election year gains and losses tend to weigh more. Now there, there's this wag the dog notion foreign policy and there's the election year surprise, the October surprise fear that comes up every four years. There is a statistically significant effect here that gains or losses in pocketbook issues in the election year have a stronger effect. Now there's some competing explanations for why this should be the case. One of them is the what have you done for me lately kind of explanation doesn't matter when, you, when you're a voter and you talk with uh, an elected official, so you did this, so you did this, but what have you done for me lately? That's one explanation. The other explanation is media bias, and this is particularly pronounced in trying to explain the 1992 election and that the, the numbers seem to indicate that the economy was doing fairly well, but the drumbeat of stories in the election year was negative. Maybe that had something to do with it. I'll offer these as two competing uh, two competing explanations for why this matters, but it is clear the good news factor matters. What happens in an election year outweighs to some degree what happened in previous years. So with that background, let's go on to predicting the 2004 election. 
And here's what we'll do. We'll specify a rational voter model. We'll estimate the model for the past elections, meaning we'll see how well it explains them. Then we'll make some assumptions about 2004, and then we'll predict the results for 2004. That's what we're going to do. Let's start. We'll go with the national voting model. We'll take these uh, five variables, income, unemployment, inflation, war, and important third party candidates. Those are the only five variables we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to weigh good news more heavily, meaning that we're going to say income gains are important, but they're especially important in the last year. Uh, inflation is important, but it's especially important in the last year. So we're going to be calculating these variables with a heavy weight on the last year. Uh, I want to note here that this is a fair test. We are not including sentiment variables. Sometimes you see these and say, oh, I can predict the uh, presidential election. I look at the stock market. I look at consumer confidence. What you're looking at is a disguised sentiment there. People are, in effect, saying, I'm happy. I'm going to vote for the incumbent. I think he's going to win. I, and I'm more likely to invest in the stock market. There's none of this in here. No poll data, no stock market results, no survey data. Simply uh, hard numbers here. Some subjectivity as we get to on war and third party candidates, but pretty much hard numbers. How well does this work? Well, there are many variations on these models, even within the same very family of variables. Uh, these tend to explain 60 to 80 percent consistently of the variation in vote. Uh, you can put them together where they explain 90 percent of the past vote. We tend to not do that because we're, we're interested in what's causing things, not just making something that, make, that fits the data. But 60 to 80 percent, so the question is how rational are the voters here? Well, they're pretty rational. Pocketbook issues consistently explain somewhere around three quarters of the voting patterns, but not 100 percent. Now let's look at one ours in particular. We have a, a model that we built that explains the incumbent party's vote share for presidential elections from 1916 to 2000. We've actually done this all the way back to 1860, but we tend to be better in the last century than we did in the 1800s, so we dropped that. I don't understand 1800 voters that well. Uh, I think I understand those, the Federalist Papers, 1770s. That was really a good age, uh, but 1800 voters I don't quite get. Uh, and here's what we included. Income and employment variables weighted the last term. Inflation and deflation, very interesting. It's, uh, people think inflation is bad. It, it is bad, but what's really bad is big deflation. And what we had in, in our country in the Depression was deflation. We had uh, prices drop 10 percent in the election year. Very, very bad if you're the incumbent. Herbert Hoover was the incumbent at that time. We included in this one a limited war variable. We did not include the more traditional war for, for uh, World War II, World War I. We included a variable for limited war, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq. Uh, this is kind of inter interesting in the sense that this has not been done often in the past. We think it affects, uh, affects the vote. We think people look at their satisfaction differently when they have a limited war going on. Uh, and this is our attempt at doing that. And we, we look at third party candidates with ballot access and the likelihood of 2% or better vote share. That's our definition of a, of a significant third party candidate. We'll acknowledge there's some subjectivity on that. And we'll see how well do we do? Well, we explain 80% of the variation of votes from 1916 to 2000, and we pick the winners in 18 out of 21 elections. Uh, clear winner here, including every election from 1916 to 1944. I want to be more specific here on, what, on our track record. Uh, for 2000, we predicted, you know, basically a tie. Uh, and maybe it was a little bit more for George Bush. So I would say the market was accurate, but was not correct in the sense that statistically uh, the incumbent, uh, Gore, got a little bit more of the popular vote than Bush did. So that's an accurate prediction, but it's not, it's not correct in the sense. In 1948, we predicted a razor-thin margin for Truman. That's great. That was correct, but it wasn't really accurate because Truman actually won uh, by four points. There are two years that were just flat wrong, 1976 and 1992. And pretty much what happens in these, these models nationally is uh, 1992, they often get wrong. If you look at the data, it just seems that George Bush, uh, the first, ought to have been reelected, but he wasn't. Uh, and 1976, uh, when Jerry Ford ran for uh, election, those are the only two, uh, only two years in which we were flat wrong. Uh, so I'd say uh, approximately it's a very good guide in 19 out of 21 races. 19 out of 21 races, if you looked at this, 
and you generally could look at it around where we are now in the summer, you would have a good indication if the model says this person wins, they're going to win. If it says they're going to lose, they're going to lose. If it says it's going to be close, it's going to be close. Okay, and here's a, just to kind of give you back uh, the, the uh, graphics here. The uh, actual vote are the little blue dots, and this is uh, all done in terms of the percentage of uh, votes uh, margin for the incumbent party. And you see in 1916, we predicted dead on. The incumbent would, uh, would uh, win by a little bit. In 1920, whew, that's an awful one there. The incumbent party lost by 30%. You see we're right on. Uh, in 1924, oh, they were in, and we predicted that. Same thing as in 1928. 1932, uh, we predicted, when I say we predicted, we predict using data now, what would have happened in 1932 if we were smart enough to have this model uh, and been around. We predicted that Herbert Hoover would have lost by 20 points, and that's exactly what would happen. And then you see in uh, 1936, 1940, 1944, all strong predictions for federal, uh, for uh, FDR to win. 1948, okay, we predict a razor-thin margin, one of the toughest ones to predict. And we were right. In fact, Truman did win, but uh, his, vote, his vote share was actually uh, pretty substantial, 4%. 1956, uh, we predict uh, correctly Eisenhower re-election. And 1952, we're dead on that, uh, that uh, the Democrats are not going to stay in office anymore. Uh, interesting that you go ahead. Uh, this is really a very good uh, track record here. 1960, all right, we predicted uh, a little stronger election victory than happened. 1964, we're on. 1968, we predict that, uh, that um, Nixon would win. Uh, and we start to have a little bit of problem in 1976, where we just don't get that one right. We predict that Jerry Ford should be reelected. The economy says that Jerry Ford should be reelected. The voters do not agree. But every once in a while, those voters just don't do what they're, they're uh, supposed to do, so to speak. Uh, it, pretty clear in 1980, we say Reagan is going to win, and Reagan wins big. In 1984, Reagan should win re-election. It's kind of interesting. There you see the blue dot in 1984 way up there. Uh, Reagan did better than the pocketbook said he should have. And I think uh, Cleve's uh, short testimonial here is an indication of that. And you get uh, 1988, we're just dead on. I mean, the, you see the dot right on, on the star. Uh, and 1992, we thought uh, George Bush should win narrowly. He did. He lost. And in that year, you get this third party issue, and you kind of argue with that. Then you look in, uh, in uh, 2000. We're dead on there in 2000. We predict uh, you know, a, a half percent, one percent margin, and that's exactly where it is. We just happen to be on the other side of, of half point. So you can say we well, count that as a W because we predicted George Bush would win, but we did say that, uh, that he would get a higher, uh, higher vote total than he actually did by a quarter percent. All right, so that's our track record. I think it's pretty good. Let's look at 2004 and see where we are. Here we go. Next slide, Ilhan. Here's our assumptions for 2004 because we need to predict this year. Income, income is growing significantly. Now, again, we're using hard numbers here. If you look at income gains across the country, there's no question that people's income is growing. In fact, we've had some of the fastest GDP growth uh, since the 1980s. Uh, and you know how that guy did. Uh, on the pocketbook issues recently. So income's growing significantly. Unemployment is dropping. In Michigan, our unemployment's been higher, so maybe the news locally has not been as good. But unemployment is clearly dropping fast. And if you look at recent good news, if you're trying to figure out not just how, how George Bush has done on his whole watch, but how has he done this year or the last four quarters. The last four quarters have been the best four quarters for George Bush. So that's all good. So on income, unemployment, and, and looking at it from a good news perspective, no question, very positive for the incumbent. Then you get to, to number four, war. There's a painful limited war going on. I don't have to tell anybody here about that. I don't uh, pretend to have uh, sp more specific information than anyone else. We just note that this, this is a factor that affects negatively voter perceptions of the, of the commander in chief. Voter fatigue. There's no new party. Or it's a new party in office, so there's little fatigue. If this was, if you think back to George Bush the first, that was the third Republican incumbency, and that was one of those, one of those factors that can explain why this model didn't quite get that one right because there's a voter fatigue there. 
And there's no significant third party candidate of the incumbent's philosophy, but the Nader candidacy could be significant. How significant? I don't know. This is if you're making, and this uh, will acknowledge we had to make a subjective judgment about whether there's an important third party candidate or not. We said we think there probably will be. So those are our assumptions for 2004. Now we have to do the prediction. So you want to push the button here on? Okay, we'll do this. Here's our prediction. George Bush reelected in 2004. Uh, our model says income and employment gains for the last two years, no question, very strong positive. First term for Republicans, little voter fatigue. The one overriding negative is a painful limited war, and to the extent third party candidates are going to be a factor, it's on the challenger side. It's more likely to negatively affect uh, John Kerry's vote than it would be George Bush's. And the margin, where's the margin going to be? Well, we'll go out on a limb and say 1 to 3 percent nationally. Now, I must say that, that uh, this is this model we like. There's only five variables in it, but you can put more in. You could change it around. Uh, we've done probably 100 of them, Ilhan and I, and uh, some of, in some cases, these pocketbook models predict as high as 6 or 7 or 8 percent. I think that's a little bit on the high side, uh, but the pocketbook models clearly say that uh, the, re the incumbent should be reelected in 2004. Now, let's look at something here. This is... Uh, Un untraveled territory. People really haven't done this kind of work for Michigans to see how they're differently. State voting is more erratic than the national. And uh, I, I know we have uh, the former mayor here, an elected official, among others. Uh, we have some people that have uh, experience with this, but Michigan has a history of economic swings and a ticket splitter reputation. And here we are sitting here. We've got a Democrat governor and Republican Supreme Court and uh, House and Senate and majority in Congress. Obviously, people in Michigan are not going straight down the line. They do split their tickets. And Michigan has supported third party candidates in both general elections and primaries. And I, I give an example. Teddy Roosevelt, when he was running the Bull Moose Party, won Michigan. Not the Republican, not the Democrat. Teddy won. Uh, George Wallace, Democratic primary in 1968. Ross Perot, very well. Pat Buchanan, John McCain winning the, the uh, uh, Republican primary here. Uh, while, the, while the rest of the country was ready to say George Bush is our person, Michigan voters went there. So it's an ornery kind of uh, uh, contrary, we'll do it our own way state. Uh, and we said, well, well, we'll forge ahead nonetheless and see how well the pocketbook predicts Michigan. Well, key variables, we, we looked at the same ones. And here's what happened. Michigan just can't be explained very well with the pocketbook. Nationally, you can predict, I mean, we'll come up with a prediction for 2004 nationally and have some confidence with it. Michigan, you know, you can only explain about half the variation in the votes. Uh, unemployment, very interesting. Unemployment matters more here. We're more sensitive to unemployment than we are to gains in income. Third party candidates are a huge effect here, much more than the national nation whole. And it's also interesting, war affects Michigan voters differently, and I thought about this quite a bit, but you get in a limited war, Michigan voters are really cautious about that. I don't have a full explanation, but I'm thinking of the, the history we've had here. Obviously, we have a lot of patriotic uh, uh, efforts in Civil War, a Red Arrow Highway out here in World War I commemorating the, the, the people that went off there. Uh, but limited war is, is something that uh, Michigan voters are, are much more cautious about. So if you try to look at, at Michigan, pocketbook issues favor Bush. Income's growing, unemployment's still higher, but it's dropping. But the Iraq war is gonna, gonna weigh down the Bush vote more heavily here in Michigan than in other states. Michigan voters historically cautious. And therefore, uh, we'll, we'll show you how Michigan does versus the nation as a whole. And you've got uh, red is Michigan and blue is, is the US. And you see, I mean, we, Sometimes, like with the Reagan uh, landslides, we're dead on, but other ones, we're just, we're just off. I mean, and we can be, there's a pattern here, there's a relationship, but we are not hand in glove with, with the nation as a whole. So, uh, no third party challenger to Bush. Nader, would, I think, would be attractive to some voters if he's on the ballot here in Michigan. And economic issues only explain about half the Michigan vote. Therefore, I'll boldly say that I don't have a confident prediction for Michigan. <laughs> Okay, 
A little conclusions here. One, economics isn't everything. I'm an economist, but one of the things I learned going back from Adam Smith, who uh, wrote a book called Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, which isn't as well known as, as Wealth of Nations, but which uh, uh, points out what he really views the purpose of economics as. Economics isn't everything. Pocketbook issues aren't everything. But they're a lot, and they do uh, have very strong effects. Some variables are hard to define. For example, third-party candidacy, limited war. Just defining them is hard. Sometimes the world changes. If you think in 1991 the Berlin Wall fell, that meant the 1992 election was in a different world. Uh, September 11, 2001 created a different world, as we all know. The end of World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, these things can change structurally the way people look. And uh, uh, that means they act differently. And of course, people are not completely predictable, thankfully. Uh, otherwise, it would be a very boring job to be an economist. Uh, and for 2004, yes, voters are predictable, but only so far. Higher income employment indicates a Bush re-election nationally in 2004, but Michigan voters are far more ornery and unpredictable, so Michigan is up for grads. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. That's the uh, end of my, con my presentation today. Well, Patrick is willing to take some, some questions from you. I'm sure that you have some tough questions, uh, after, uh, especially after the Michigan model comes up. So uh, please uh, have at it. We have about uh, 20 minutes or so. Will that be OK? All right. Questions? Okay. Hey, question is about uh, running mates. And we didn't put that here in the, in the pocketbook uh, model. Uh, and really, your political scientists and, and armchair uh, historians and, and front chair historians will do a, a, a lot better on this one. Uh, our, we, we're not finding much kind of uh, VP effect here. And I think particularly when you have an incumbent running, it's a referendum on the incumbent. Uh, and part of what, indirectly, what we're saying here by even forming the, the statistics of it in terms of the vote share for the incumbent party and finding that we can consistently predict about three quarters of that variation. What we're finding is that voters with the same person in office view it as a referendum on the incumbent. And even if it's not the same person but the same party, they're still viewing it with some skepticism as a referendum on the incumbent party. So uh, the short answer to your question in terms of the pocketbook model is that it doesn't seem to matter that much. Now, it doesn't matter that much if, if you're satisfied with predicting three quarters of the vote. If you're John Kerry and you say, my only chance of winning is to patch together enough of these and I need a 1% margin in a couple states, then it matters an awful lot. Uh, and we're just, not, we're just not good enough with these variables to get anywhere close to that. So, so pocketbook says, nationally doesn't matter much. Electoral map does matter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the things that I remember looking at, uh, and to answer your question about uh, something bad happened. I remember when I was a, a, a younger man and it looked like the country was kind of falling apart in 1968. Somebody had ran, I think it was one of the car companies ran this uh, ad showing all the crises we would had throughout history. I remember Teapot Dome. I remember reading going, what's a Teapot Dome? Why was that a crisis? Uh, but if you go through our history, we've had crises almost every year. And I, I can predict with high confidence that there'll be another crisis over the next, over the next year. I just don't know where it's going to be or what it's going to be about. Uh, when we have some presence, it's pretty clear where the crisis is going to be, what it's going to be about. With this one, you don't know. Uh, and uh, so I think first is there's likely to be another crisis and people will expect that. We're not showing it here. So you can explain some of the, some of the events here where we couldn't explain the election. You can tie it to an event. For example, the Jerry Ford uh, election where we predicted he'd be reelected. He was not. Well, one of the reasons he wasn't elected first, he came in, he, he carried a lot of Nixon's baggage. You had the whole Watergate thing hang on. We didn't put that in the model. Clearly, that explains some of the, the negative. Uh, George Bush, uh, 
first George Bush, his electoral loss, another one that could not be explained. I mean, in that, in that uh, situation, you had a triumphant win in the war, and the economy just started to falter a little bit, and you had a third party candidate. That seemed to, those things together, put it together as something there. So th what I would tell you from the evidence here is that simply having a crisis doesn't seem to affect this. People expect the president to be on, on, on hand for a crisis. That's why you elect a commander in chief. But uh, events that, that change the regime, change the world to some degree, those do matter. So what I'd, and, and things like uh, uh, Watergate, the uh, end of the Berlin, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall changed from a Cold War to a seeming like we're the only superpower, we have no problems era. Those things have an effect. Uh, September 11th, I think that does change the world, and we're, we're dealing with that now, and we have a much more dangerous world than it, we appeared to have on September 10th. Uh, and I think that changes things a little bit, but a single crisis I don't think does. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. If we put campaign spending in, do I think it would matter? My bet is that it doesn't matter. And I haven't done it, but here's why I don't think. First of all, uh, the campaign finance laws are, are largely created by people who are elected officials. They, they tend to set up the rules so that they have enough money to run for re-election. Uh, and the major parties have been, at least on presidential campaigns, largely competitive. And also, people make up their mind. Part of what this pocketbook model is telling you is that if you spent nothing, you probably lose a little bit, but you can look at things like whether people have jobs, whether their income's growing, whether inflation's taking some of that income from them, and you can predict three quarters of the election from that. So with that in mind, what you're saying is that campaign spending are going after, say, 30 percent of the vote. Now that's a lot to go after if you're, you're in a tight race, but it is not the whole, whole shebang. The other reason why I'd be, I, my guess is it wouldn't work, is I don't think it's reported accurately. For example, where do you put George Soros's 100 million or ever many he's put in the move on? Uh, we pass McCain-Feingold and that means that you can't spend money legally, but you can create another organization. And I just don't know where to, where to even find that money. So my guess is probably doesn't matter, but we haven't put it in. Okay, I have a question over here. Yes, yes sir. That's a, that's a good one here. So what we're trying to do, maybe Elhan, if you go back to the slide that shows the up and, up and down uh, for it nationally. Uh, what we're trying to do here is say, yeah, this one, okay, is can we predict those blue dots here if we only knew economic variables and just a couple institutional factors? Is there a war going on? Do we have three parties on the, can, on the ballot in, in a large number of states? I'd say it's a, it's a fair question, and if I put in things like the stock market or consumer confidence or survey, I'm no longer guessing. I'm no longer testing whether pocketbook issues predict. I'm just now uh, testing whether people are telling you the truth about who they're going to vote for later on. Uh, and that's why we have not put any sentiment, sentiment issues in here. Now, it is interesting if you get over to the pollsters and you find out people don't always accurately say what they're going to do. I mean, uh, Harry Truman election, great one. The first poll, first national poll is a great election, which was uh, is a great example. It was taken by, was it Ladies Home Journal, something a little president. I got to send this in to Ask Gleaves, he'll probably know. But uh, uh, the first major poll was undertaken by a national magazine, I think it was 1932. Uh, it was FDR versus Alf Landon, whatever year that was, maybe 1936. And uh, they got a list of uh, people who had telephones, and they called them up, and they asked them who you're going to vote for. And overwhelmingly, they said they're going to vote for Alf Landon. And they published this with great fanfare, and was done nice random survey of telephone owners. And it you know, obviously was hugely wrong. Well, why? Well, they called up telephone owners in 1936, and those people were not voting for FDR. Uh, and that those kind of errors still go on in survey research, and also people sometimes don't tell the, the pollsters what they want, and sometimes the polling questions are slanted. Uh, so that's something to think about there. What we're giving ourselves is a tough question in terms of 
raw economic performance, how much of the vote does that predict, regardless of how much campaign spending went on, regardless of crises that happened in the, in the last four, five months, regardless of anything else, how much does that tell us? Our answer is 19 out of 21 times it gives us the right answer. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, what I was saying, I'll get two parts to the, to the uh, answer. First, what did we mean by good news in recent events? What we defined that was, was we looked at economic variables heavily weighted to what happened in the last year. So we could have looked at the average unemployment rate for the four years of Bush's term versus before. We could have looked at real income growth uh, average. We didn't. In this model here, we weighted it to, towards the last year. So specifically, what we did here was recent income and employment gains. Uh, and as I, as I answered in the previous, uh, previous question, uh, we did not include lots of other factors that voters explicitly take into account. Uh, we're, we're not here saying that voters are robots. They are not. The best we can do is predict about three quarters. There are other things going on that I take into account, that everyone in this room will take into account. But it seems about three quarters of the, of the picture is how your pocketbook issue comes. Now the second, the second part answer the question, and it, you know, just kind of a, a implication in the in the way you pose the question, is you look at the news and you see a lot of things that are negative. Other people look at the news and say, boy, that's that's bad that these things happen. But what's really important is these positive things are going on. What that indicates is you have, I would say you generally, but people that look at this, you have a party preference. You have a lens with which you view the world, and some things matter more to you one way than another. And, and when we say we predict George Bush is reelected, we are not predicting that 100% of the people vote for George Bush. We're predicting that after four years in office, he'll gain somewhere between 1% and 3% more votes than his strongest challenger. So that means there will be a large number of people that don't vote for him, even if we're exactly correct. And my guess is that the people that don't vote for him will look at the same newscast that you look at, uh, and I look at, and come to a different conclusion. Uh, yes, right back there. I think the, uh, the uh, for presidential races in particular, some of the uh, voter apathy claims are a little overstated. Uh, Americans still vote pretty strongly in national elections. Uh, it is not always the case if you get to, I mean, I missed a school board election yesterday, and I never miss a vote, but they pulled it out on a Monday in June uh, in this particular case, and I end up missing it. Uh, and uh, I feel bad about it still. I'm perhaps in the minority that tries to religiously vote. But people do vote, and even sometimes uh, when people are, when the, especially in the news media, you occasionally have people saying, well, it's, it's terrible that people went and didn't vote. The, the whole undervote phenomenon, for example, where people went to the polls and didn't vote in certain races was discussed in 2000 as if it was a new phenomenon or probably the problem with the voting machine. It's not a problem with the voting machine. It goes on in every state in every election, and in fact, uh, what I wrote an article about this uh, four years ago indicating the, the uh, size of the undervote in Michigan, pointing out that the undervote in Michigan, people that went to the polls in 2000 to vote on a presidential race and didn't vote in the Senate race, was on the ballot there, closely aligned, was multiple of the margin in that race. That was an important race. Some people go to, go to the ballot box and make a decision not to vote because they feel they don't know enough or other people as a whole would, would matter more than that. Now, if you get outside the presidential race, I do think voter apathy is a problem. Uh, in some of the other races, 
And I think uh, some of the institutional changes, for example, term limits when I was involved, and I thought that would help get, get more people involved, get more real people uh, running. Not everyone agrees with that, but that was uh, the majority of the Michigan voters did. And that was an effort to get at that at, at the state level. In terms of the model, uh, it, it doesn't show up here because we're looking at the difference in votes gained by the incumbent party versus its strongest challenger. So it doesn't really affect uh, how we've done it here. We've taken into account, we're only looking at people who actually vote. And I can't tell you if we got into, into that range of people that sometimes vote, sometimes don't in a presidential election, what would happen? Yes, sir. Can you can you uh, go up, Elhan, to the prediction? Okay, margin likely to be one to three percent. What we're saying is our model indicates that George Bush should gain about 2% uh, margin above his strongest competitor, pr presumably John Kerry. So uh, if you looked at Republican Democratic votes this year, we're expecting, say, 51, 49% breakdown of that. Uh, maybe another 2%, say, for Nader. That would be, if that was to happen, uh, you know, say, 50, 49, 47, 2. And that adds quite up to 100, but something close to that. That would be exactly what we're predicting. And we're saying that, you know, really, it's more like 1% to 3%. We're not going to, you know, if, we, if it's 3%, I'm going to say, boy, we were right on. If it's 1%, it's right on. If it's 8% or if it's negative 3, we were wrong. So that's, that's what I implied by here. In terms of the, uh, of the specific statistical meaning of standard error and everything. I always know in every audience there's somebody that took econometrics that asked the question. And if you come up afterwards, Ilhan has got all the data and we, you, you can look at that. And we'll be happy to share it with you. So. All right, well, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. I learned quite a bit from you, uh, Patrick, in that. And uh, as, as always, we'll be anxiously awaiting to see just how good a profit you are come November 2nd. Well, that concludes our morning. You know, before we break, though, I want to thank a couple of people. Uh, you know, events like this never happen unless you have uh, good people who help make them happen. And I want to thank uh, uh, Seedman School of Business Alumni Association. I want to thank the president of the association, uh, Mark Derwent, who's up here in the uh, uh, side. And I also want to thank the interim dean, uh, John Rifle. I want to thank Bonnie Herrera on the Seedman staff and there are other Seedman staff who are here who help make this happen. I want to thank my staff at the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. Also, let me just put in a little plug here. Uh, you saw that there's a website that uh, the Anderson Economic Group, which uh, you might want to show that slide up there again if you can. The website, to, or is it gone? <laughs> Uh, but there's a website for uh, presidential data, for uh, economic data, I think you'll find interesting. And also, I urge you to visit allpresidents.org, uh, the Hauenstein Center website, to keep abreast of all the developments in the presidency and look uh, for the exclusives that we run as well. Well, thank you very much for coming this morning, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next presentation.